You know, something really cool is happening right now, but not many of us realize how cool this thing really is. So, I'm hoping that you and I can spread this story a little bit. Come on. A lot of snakes out today. Before I forget, Mother Nature is the essence of suspense, magic, and wonder. Hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon, and together we'll unveil her secrets every week. <laughs> There's a lot of noise going on over there right now. So, how you guys doing? I'm Chris Ignato. It's good to see you again. You know, it was a cold week, but the temperatures have definitely risen a little bit this weekend. And I decided to come and explore this forest because I haven't been here for a few years and it's beautiful weather. While I'm walking along and soaking in the weather and pondering the sights and sounds, I realize there's a lot of things that I talk about in my public programs and private tours and things like that that I fail to mention in my videos and there's no real reason why. If you watch my channel, you might notice that this time of year I focus a lot of my attention on the breeding salamanders and frog activity at the vernal pools because I love them and it's really exciting. A lot of other people will focus a lot of their attention on the migrating birds and their beautiful songs and courting behavior because they're beautiful, right? As I speak, there's a family of deer behind this camera with a fawn, another textbook image of spring. You've got lots of baby rabbits. The fox kits are venturing farther from their lairs and exploring and getting a proper introduction to their environment, right? Unfortunately, there are still things that fail to get the attention they deserve. And today's video, I wanna to touch base on just one of those things because it's pretty awesome. Check this out. As we know, there's a few things that spring is famous for. I mean, April showers bring May flowers, right? And the other one is even more obvious. The overall temperatures are warmer. The heat of the soils increase week by week. So needless to say, the botanical world loves that warm temperature and the abundance of all the water. That's what gets the seeds to germinate and allow these trees and plants to grow big and strong, right? But there's another factor, a big one, that people often fail to mention. And that has to do with the color of sunlight reaching the ground. You see, without getting very technical here, there's two different types of plants. There are the plants that thrive in springtime, pretty much being all those shorter plants in the understory. And then of course, there are plants that thrive in summer light. The most easily recognized of all those are of course the trees. In March and April, winter is pretty much finished for the year and spring moves in to take its place. The days are growing longer and causing the environment to basically warm up. While that's going on, all sorts of air masses high above are trading places, mingling, and shifting from here to there. The trading of those air masses often results in lots of wind and of course, rain. Combine that heat and rain and you've got two very key ingredients for the recipe of germination. What do you notice in the summertime as you walk into a forest? Yeah, well, the air might be thick and a little bit muggy or humid, but there's something else you notice almost immediately. It's filled with shade, right? Yeah, the forest is definitely darker than the surrounding landscape. And if you pay real close attention, you'll notice that that shade takes on a green hue to it, doesn't it? We've all seen and appreciated the beauty of a rainbow. And we know that the water droplets in the air act as prisms separating the sun's spectrum 
into its individual colors, right? Leaves soak up the red and blue wavelengths of sunlight, and the only wavelength that really passes through them, of course, is green. That's why leaves look green, and the shade in the forest environment is on the green side. For the trees, the other plants are really no competition for them. The tree roots reach further into the soil, allowing them to soak up water that's inaccessible for the understory plants with shallower roots. And of course, those giant canopies can take all the sunlight they want, whereas the little guys below can't really do anything about it. Needless to say, the trees are pretty much the kings of the playing field. There's something that the springtime plants do to protect themselves from competing with the trees and therefore being starved of the precious sunlight, which again is the crucial ingredient plants use to manufacture food. The way they do this is ingenious. In the spring, there are no leaves in the tree canopy. The sun's full spectrum reaches the ground. The most important part of the spectrum is the color red. That's what triggers these seeds to germinate. These springtime plants prevent their seeds from germinating in the summertime where they'd have to run the risk of competing with the forest canopy above by depending on that red spectrum of the sun's light. And if you remember, I said that the leaves soak up the red and blue wavelengths of the sunlight, pretty much only allowing green light to reach the forest floor. That green light pretty much tells the seeds to remain dormant. But in the springtime, there are no leaves to soak up that red spectrum and therefore rob the forest floor of the red light. And that is how the springtime plants germinate and thrive. By the time the forest canopy develops all its leaves, the plants have moved on from depending on their leaves and focus more of their energy on, well, producing more seeds for the coming year. And that is why the understory plants have that dependency on the red spectrum in order to germinate their seeds, allowing the plants to capitalize on the ideal growing period before the canopy above takes over and blocks out that crucial sunlight. That's why when you look throughout the forest, you'll notice several distinct periods throughout each season. Awesome, isn't it? So check this out. I've been thinking, um, Okay, well, the, in the springtime, the understory is saturated with green leaves to later on trade shifts with the canopy above for the monopoly on green. How come certain species in the springtime produce a lot of red leaves? I know in the fall that has to do with temperature and anthocyanins and whatnot. But how come in the spring certain plants have a lot of red leaves? Maybe, I'm thinking, Okay, so those green leaves soak up the red and blue spectrums, right? And the green light passes through to the ground and it's not exactly being taken advantage of. What if those red leaves soak up the green wavelength and use that to produce or manufacture its sugars and foods for the plant and therefore capitalizing on an abundant commodity? <laughs> it's just a theory of mine, but it gets me thinking and wondering, what if that's what's going on? Kind of fun. Hmm. Actually, I might be wrong on that. I already know that iron and nitrogen levels and even light can affect the redness of leaves. But it was just a theory after all. It never hurts to ponder the, the natural world. All of this basically means that the understory plants have a different growing season because, well, it's crucial to their survival, right? I mean, there's no other way about it. You know, thinking about this, there are a lot of other things about leaves and plants and even flowers and everything else around that I just never get around to in any of my videos. I'm usually a bit better in person for that kind of stuff. Not sure why. In the meantime, I hope you guys learned something cool and found yourself inspired to keep going out there and exploring and staying curious. Thanks a lot for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Ignato, signing out. Jeez Louise, bird. <laughs>